Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria, the 1st of December 1949, the 2nd of December 1993, was a Colombian drug lord and narco terrorist who was the founder and sole leader of the Medellin cartel. Dubbed the king of cocaine, Escobar is the wealthiest criminal in history, having amassed an estimated net worth of 30 billion US dollars by the time of his death, equivalent to 64 billion dollars as of 2021 while his drug cartel monopolized the cocaine trade into the United States in the 1980s and early 1990s. Born in Rio Negro and raised in Medellin, Escobar studied briefly at Universidad Autónoma Latinoamericana of Medellin, but left without graduating, he instead began engaging in criminal activity, selling illegal cigarettes and fake lottery tickets, as well as participating in motor vehicle theft. In the early 1970s, he began to work for various drug smugglers, often kidnapping and holding people for ransom. In 1976, Escobar founded the Medellin cartel, which distributed powder cocaine, and established the first smuggling routes into the United States. Escobar's infiltration into the U.S. created exponential demand for cocaine and by the 1980s it was estimated Escobar led monthly shipments of 70 to 80 tons of cocaine into the country from Colombia. As a result, he quickly became one of the richest people in the world, but constantly battled rival cartels domestically and abroad, leading to massacres and the murders of police officers, judges, locals, and prominent politicians, making Colombia the murder capital of the world. In the 1982 Colombian parliamentary election, Escobar was elected as an alternate member of the Chamber of Representatives as part of the liberal alternative movement. Through this, he was responsible for community projects such as the construction of houses and football fields, which gained him popularity among the locals of the towns that he frequented. However, Escobar's political ambitions were thwarted by the Colombian and U.S. governments, who routinely pushed for his arrest, with Escobar widely believed to have orchestrated the DS building and Ovianca Flight 203 bombings in retaliation. In 1991, Escobar surrendered to authorities, and was sentenced, to five years imprisonment on a host of charges, but struck a deal of no extradition with Colombian President Cesar Gaviria, with the ability of being housed in his own, self-built prison, La Catedral. In 1992, Escobar escaped and went into hiding when authorities attempted to move him to a more standard holding facility, leading to a nationwide manhunt. As a result, the Medellin cartel crumbled, and in 1993, Escobar was killed in his hometown by Colombian National Police, a day after his 44th birthday. Escobar's legacy remains controversial, while many denounce the heinous nature of his crimes, he was seen as a Robin Hood like figure for many in Colombia, as he provided many amenities to the poor. His killing was mourned and his funeral attended by over 25,000 people. Additionally, his private estate, Hacienda Napoles, has been transformed into a theme park. His life has also served as inspiration for or has been dramatized widely in film, television, and in music. Chapter 1 Early Life Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria was born on 1 December 1949, in Rio Negro, in the Antioquia Department of Colombia. He was the third of seven children of the farmer Abel de Jesus Dari Escobar Echeverri, with his wife Emilda de los Dolores Gaviria Birrio, an elementary school teacher. Raised in the nearby city of Medellin, Escobar is thought to have begun his criminal career as a teenager, allegedly stealing gravestones and sanding them down for resale to local smugglers. His brother, Roberto Escobar, denies this instead claiming that the gravestones came from cemetery owners whose clients had stopped paying for site care and that he had a relative who had a monuments business. Escobar's son, Sebastian Marroquin, claims his father's foray into crime began with a successful practice of selling counterfeit high school diplomas, generally counterfeiting those awarded by the Universidad Autónoma Latinoamericana of Medellín. Escobar studied at the university for a short period, but left without obtaining a degree. Escobar eventually became involved in many criminal activities with Oscar Benalaguirre, with the duo running petty street scams, selling contraband cigarettes, fake lottery tickets, and stealing cars. In the early 1970s, prior to entering the drug trade, 
Escobar acted as a thief and bodyguard, allegedly earning 100,000 US dollars by kidnapping and holding a Medellin executive for ransom. Escobar began working for Alvaro Prieto, a contraband smuggler who operated around Medellin, aiming to fulfill a childhood ambition to have call $1 million by the time he was 22. He is known to have had a bank deposit of call $100 million when he turned 26. Chapter 2 Criminal Career Chapter 2 Section 1 Cocaine Distribution In the accountant's story, Roberto Escobar discusses how Pablo rose from middle-class simplicity and obscurity to one of the world's wealthiest men. Beginning in 1975, Pablo started developing his cocaine operation, flying out planes several times, mainly between Colombia and Panama, along smuggling routes into the United States. When he later bought 15 bigger airplanes, including a Learjet and six helicopters, a close friend of Pablo's died during the landing of an airplane along with the plane being destroyed, according to his son. Pablo reconstructed the airplane from the scrap parts that were left and later hung it above the gate to his ranch at Hacienda Napoles. In May 1976, Escobar and several of his men were arrested and found in possession of 18 kilograms of white paste, attempting to return to Medellin with a heavy load from Ecuador. Initially, Pablo tried to bribe the Medellin judges who were forming a case against him, and was unsuccessful. After many months of legal wrangling, he ordered the murder of the two arresting officers, and the case was later dropped. Roberto Escobar details this as the point where Pablo began his pattern of dealing with the authorities through either bribery or murder. Chapter 2 Section 2 Rise to Prominence Soon, the demand for cocaine greatly increased in the United States, which led to Escobar organizing more smuggling shipments, routes, and distribution networks in South Florida, California, Puerto Rico, and other parts of the country. He and cartel co-founder Carlos led a work together to develop a new transshipment point in the Bahamas, an island called Norman's Cay about 350 kilometers southeast of the Florida coast. According to his brother, Escobar did not purchase Norman's K, it was instead a sole venture of Ledders. Escobar and Robert Fesco purchased most of the land on the island, which included a one-kilometer airstrip, a harbor, a hotel, houses, boats, and aircraft, and they built a refrigerated warehouse to store the cocaine. From 1978 to 1982, this was used as a central smuggling route for the Medellin cartel. With the enormous profits generated by this route, Escobar was soon able to purchase 20 square kilometers of land in Antioquia for several million dollars, on which he built the Hacienda Napoles. The luxury house he created contained a zoo, a lake, a sculpture garden, a private bullring, and other diversions for his family and the cartel. Chapter 2 Section 3 – Established Drug Network in 1982 Escobar was elected as an alternate member of the Chamber of Representatives of Colombia, as part of a small movement called Liberal Alternative. Earlier in the campaign he was a candidate for the Liberal Renewal Movement, but had to leave it because of the firm opposition of Luis Carlos Gallon, whose presidential campaign was supported by the Liberal Renewal Movement. Escobar was the official representative of the Colombian government for the swearing in of Felipe González in Spain. Escobar quickly became known internationally as his drug network gained notoriety. The Medellin cartel controlled a large portion of the drugs that entered the United States, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, and Spain. The production process was also altered, with coca from Bolivia and Peru replacing the coca from Colombia which was beginning to be seen as substandard quality than the coca from the neighboring countries. As demand for more and better cocaine increased, Escobar began working with Roberto Suarez Gomez, helping to further the product to other countries in the Americas and Europe, as well as being rumored to reach as far as Asia. Chapter 2 Section 3 Subsection 2 Palace of Justice Siege it is alleged that Escobar backed the 1985 storming of the Colombian Supreme Court by left-wing guerrillas from the 19th of April movement, also known as M-19. The siege, 
a retaliation motivated by the Supreme Court studying the constitutionality of Colombia's extradition treaty with the U.S., resulted in the murders of half the judges on the court. M-19 were paid to break into the palace and burn all papers and files on Los Extraditables, a group of cocaine smugglers who were under threat of being extradited to the U.S. by the Colombian government. Escobar was listed as a part of Los Extraditables. Hostages were also taken for negotiation of their release, thus helping to prevent the extradition of Los Extraditables to the U.S. for their crimes. Chapter 2 Section 4 Escobar at the height of his power. During the height of its operations, the Medellin cartel brought in more than 70 million US dollars per day. This level of income is roughly 26 billion dollars per annum. Smuggling 15 tons of cocaine per day into the United States, the cartel spent over 1,000 US dollars per week purchasing rubber bands to wrap the stacks of cash they received, storing most of it in their warehouses. 10% of the cash had to be written off per year because of spoilage due to rats creeping in and nibbling on the bills they could reach. When questioned about the essence of the cocaine business, Escobar replied with simple, you bribe someone here, you bribe someone there, and you pay a friendly banker to help you bring the money back. In 1989, Forbes magazine estimated Escobar to be one of 227 billionaires in the world, asserting that he had a personal net worth of approaching 3 billion US dollars, while his Medellin cartel controlled 80% of the global cocaine market. It is commonly believed that Escobar was the principal financier behind Medellin's Atletico Nacional, which won South America's most prestigious football tournament, the Copa Libertadores, in 1989. While seen as an enemy of the United States and Colombian governments, Escobar was a hero to many in Medellin, especially to the poor. He was a natural at public relations, and he worked to create goodwill among the poor of Colombia. A lifelong sports fan, he was credited with building football fields and multi-sports courts, as well as sponsoring children's football teams. Escobar was also responsible for the construction of houses and football fields in western Colombia, which gained him popularity among the poor. He worked hard to cultivate his Robin Hood image and frequently distributed money through housing projects and other civic activities, which gained him notable popularity among the locals of the towns that he frequented. Some people from Medellin often helped Escobar avoid police capture by serving as lookouts, hiding information from authorities, or doing whatever else they could to protect him. At the height of his power, drug traffickers from Medellin and other areas were handing over between 20% and 35% of their Colombian cocaine-related profits to Escobar, as he was the one who shipped the cocaine successfully to the United States. The Colombian cartel's continuing struggles to maintain supremacy resulted in Colombia quickly becoming the world's murder capital, with 25,100 violent deaths in 1991 and 27,100 in 1992. This increased murder rate was fueled by Escobar giving money to his hitmen as a reward for killing police officers, over 600 of whom died as a result. Chapter 2 Section 4 Subsection 2 La Catedral Prison After the assassination of Luis Carlos Gallon, the administration of Cesar Gaviria, moved against Escobar and the drug cartels. Eventually, the government negotiated with Escobar and convinced him to surrender and cease all criminal activity in exchange for a reduced sentence and preferential treatment during his captivity. Declaring an end to a series of previous violent acts meant to pressure authorities and public opinion, Escobar surrendered to Colombian authorities in 1991. Before he gave himself up, the extradition of Colombian citizens to the United States had been prohibited by the newly approved Colombian Constitution of 1991. This act was controversial, as it was suspected that Escobar and other drug lords had influenced members of the Constituent Assembly in passing the law. Escobar was confined in what became his own luxurious private prison, La Catedral, which featured a football pitch, a giant dollhouse, a bar, a jacuzzi, and a waterfall. Accounts of Escobar's continued criminal activities while in prison began to surface in the media, which prompted the government to attempt to move him to a more conventional jail on the 22nd of July 1992. 
Escobar's influence allowed him to discover the plan in advance and make a successful escape, spending the remainder of his life evading the police. Chapter 2 Section 4 Subsection 3 Search Block and Los Pepes Following Escobar's escape, the United States Joint Special Operations Command and Delta Force, and Centra Spike joined the manhunt for Escobar. They trained and advised a special Colombian police task force known as the Search Block, which had been created to locate Escobar. Later, as the conflict between Escobar and the governments of the United States and Colombia dragged on, and as the numbers of Escobar's enemies grew, a vigilante group known as Los Pepes was formed. The group was financed by his rivals and former associates, including the Cali cartel and right-wing paramilitaries led by Carlos Castaño, who would later fund the peasant self-defense forces of Cordoba and Uruba. Los Pepes carried out a bloody campaign, fueled by vengeance, in which more than 300 of Escobar's associates, his lawyer and relatives were killed, and a large amount of the Medellin cartel's property was destroyed. Members of the search bloc as well as Colombian and United States intelligence agencies either colluded with Los Pepes or moonlighted as both the search bloc and Los Pepes simultaneously in their efforts to find Escobar. This coordination was allegedly conducted mainly through the sharing of intelligence to allow Los Pepes to bring down Escobar and his few remaining allies, but there are reports that some individual search bloc members directly participated in missions of Los Pepes' death squads. One of the leaders of Los Pepes was Diego Murillo Bejarano, a former Medellin cartel associate who became a rival drug, kingpin, and eventually emerged as a leader of one of the most powerful factions within the self-defense of Colombia. Chapter 3 – Personal Life Chapter 3 – Section 1 – Family and Relationships In March 1976, the 26-year-old Escobar married Maria Victoria Anao, who was 15. The relationship was discouraged by the Anao family, who considered Escobar socially inferior, the pair eloped. They had two children, Juan Pablo and Manuela. In 2007, the journalist Virginia Vallejo published her memoir Amando a Pablo, Odiando Escobar, in which she describes her romantic relationship with Escobar and the links of her lover with several presidents, Caribbean dictators, and high-profile politicians. Her book inspired the movie Loving Pablo. A drug distributor, Griselda Blanco, is also reported to have conducted a clandestine, but passionate, relationship with Escobar. Several items in her diary link him with the nicknames Cocktomy Ray and Pola Blanca. Chapter 3 Section 2 Properties After becoming wealthy, Escobar created or bought numerous residences and safe houses, with the Hacienda Napoles gaining significant notoriety. The luxury house contained a colonial house, a sculpture park, and a complete zoo with animals from various continents, including elephants, exotic birds, giraffes, and hippopotamuses. Escobar had also planned to construct a Greek-style citadel near it, and though construction of the citadel was started, it was never finished. Escobar also owned a home in the U.S. under his own name, a 6,500-square-foot, pink, waterfront mansion situated at 5860 North Bay Road in Miami Beach, Florida. The four-bedroom estate, built in 1948 on Biscayne Bay, was seized by the U.S. federal government in the 1980s. Later, the dilapidated property was owned by Christian de Badoer, proprietor of the chicken kitchen fast food chain, who had bought it in 2014. De Badoer would later hire a documentary film crew and professional treasure hunters to search the edifice before and after demolition, for anything related to Escobar or his cartel. They would find unusual holes in floors and walls, as well as a safe that was stolen from its hole in the marble flooring before it could be properly examined. Escobar also owned a huge Caribbean getaway on Isla Grande, the largest of the cluster of the 27 coral cluster islands comprising Islas del Rosario, located about 35 kilometers from Cartagena. The compound, now half demolished and overtaken by vegetation and wild animals, featured a mansion, apartments, courtyards, a large swimming pool, a helicopter landing pad, reinforced windows, tiled floors, and a large but unfinished building to the side of the mansion. 
Chapter 4, Death Sixteen months after his escape from La Catedral, Pablo Escobar died in a shootout on 2 December 1993, amid another of his attempts to elude the search block. A Colombian electronic surveillance team, led by Brigadier Hugo Martinez, used radio trilateration technology to track his cell phone transmissions and found him hiding in Los Olivos, a middle-class barrio in Medellin. The search block of eight men raided the house by blowing the door open and pursuing him as he ran to the roof and tried to escape them, as well as engaging in a firefight with Escobar and his bodyguard, Alvaro de Jesus Agudelo which ensued. The two fugitives attempted to escape by running across the roofs of adjoining houses to reach a back street, but both were shot and killed by Colombian National Police. Escobar suffered gunshots to the leg and torso, and a fatal gunshot through the ear. It has never been proven who actually fired the final shot into his ear, nor has it been determined whether this shot was made during the gunfight or as part of a possible execution, with wide speculation remaining regarding the subject. Some of Escobar's relatives believe that he committed suicide. His two brothers, Roberto Escobar and Fernando Sanchez Arellano, believe that he shot himself through the ear. In a statement regarding the topic, the duo stated that Pablo had committed suicide, he did not get killed. During all the years they went after him, he would say to me every day that if he was really cornered without a way out, he would shoot himself through the ear. Chapter 5, Aftermath of His Death Soon after Escobar's death and the subsequent fragmentation of the Medellin cartel, the cocaine market became dominated by the rival Cali cartel until the mid-1990s when its leaders were either killed or captured by the Colombian government. The Robin Hood image that Escobar had cultivated maintained a lasting influence in Medellin. Many there, especially many of the city's poor whom Escobar had aided while he was alive, mourned his death, and over 25,000 people attended his funeral. Some of them consider him a saint and pray to him for receiving divine help. Chapter 5 Section 1, Virginia Vallejo's Testimony On 4 July 2006, Virginia Vallejo, a television anchor woman romantically involved with Escobar from 1983 to 1987, offered Attorney General Mario E. Guaran her testimony in the trial against former Senator Alberto Santofimio, who was accused of conspiracy in the 1989 assassination of presidential candidate Luis Carlos Gallam. E. Guaran acknowledged that, although Vallejo had contacted his office on 4 July, the judge had decided to close the trial on 9 July, several weeks before the prospective closing date. The action was seen as too late. On 18 July 2006, Vallejo was taken to the United States on a special flight of the Drug Enforcement Administration, for safety and security reasons due to her cooperation in high-profile criminal cases. On 24 July, a video in which Vallejo had accused Santofimio of instigating Escobar to eliminate presidential candidate Gallon was aired by RCN Television of Colombia. The video was seen by 14 million people, and was instrumental for the reopened case of Gallon's assassination. On 31 August, 2011 Santofimio, was sentenced to 24 years in prison for his role in the crime. Chapter 5 Section 1 Subsection 2 Role in the Palace of Justice Siege Among Escobar's biographers, only Vallejo has given a detailed explanation of his role in the 1985 Palace of Justice Siege. The journalist stated that Escobar had financed the operation, which was committed by M-19, but she blamed the army for the killings of more than 100 people, including 11 Supreme Court magistrates, M-19 members, and employees of the cafeteria. Her statements prompted the reopening of the case in 2008, Vallejo was asked to testify, and many of the events she had described in her book and testimonial were confirmed by Colombia's Commission of Truth. These events led to further investigation into the siege that resulted with the conviction of a high-ranking former colonel and a former general, later sentenced to 30 and 35 years in prison, respectively, for the forced disappearance of the detained after the siege. Vallejo would subsequently testify in Gallon's assassination. In her book, Amando a Pablo, 
Odiando Escobar, she had accused several politicians, including Colombian presidents Alfonso López Mikelson, Ernesto Sampa and Alvaro Uribe of having links to drug cartels. Due to threats, and her cooperation in these cases, on 3 June 2010 the United States granted political asylum to the Colombian journalist. Chapter 5 Section 2 Relatives Escobar's widow, son and daughter fled Colombia in 1995 after failing to find a country that would grant them asylum. Despite Escobar's numerous, and continual infidelities, Maria remained supportive of her husband. Members of the Cali cartel even replayed their recordings of her conversations with Pablo for their wives to demonstrate how a woman should behave. This attitude proved to be the reason the cartel did not kill her and her children after Pablo's death, although the group demanded millions of dollars in reparations for Escobar's war against them. And now even successfully negotiated for her son's life by personally guaranteeing he would not seek revenge against the cartel or participate in the drug trade. After escaping first to Mozambique, then to Brazil, the family settled in Argentina. Living under her assumed name, Anna became a successful real estate entrepreneur until one of her business associates discovered her true identity, and Anna absconded with her earnings. Local media were alerted, and after being exposed as Escobar's widow, Anna was imprisoned for 18 months while her finances were investigated. Ultimately, authorities were unable to link her funds to illegal activity, and she was released. According to her son, Anna fell in love with Escobar because of his naughty smile the way he looked at. Was affectionate and sweet. A great lover. I fell in love with his desire to help people and his compassion for their hardship. We drive to places where he dreamed of building schools for the poor. From beginning, he was always a gentleman. Maria Victoria Anau de Escobar, with her new identity as Maria Isabel Santos Caballero, continues to live in Buenos Aires with her son and daughter. On 5 June 2018, the Argentine federal judge Nesta Barral accused her and her son, Sebastian Marroquin Santos, of money laundering with two Colombian drug traffickers. The judge ordered the seizing of assets for about $1 million each. Argentinian filmmaker Nicolas Intel's documentary Sins of My Father chronicles Marroquin's efforts to seek forgiveness, on behalf of his father, from the sons of Rodrigo Lara. Colombia's justice minister who was assassinated in 1984, as well as from the sons of Luis Carlos Gallan, the presidential candidate who was assassinated in 1989. The film was shown at the 2010 Sundance Film Festival and premiered in the US on HBO in October 2010. In 2014, Marroquin published Pablo Escobar, My Father Under His Birth Name. The book provides a first-hand insight into details of his father's life, and describes the fundamentally disintegrating effect of his death upon the family. Marroquin aimed to publish the book in hopes to resolve any inaccuracies regarding his father's excursions during the 1990s. Escobar's sister, Luz Maria Escobar, also made multiple gestures in attempts to make amends for the drug baron's crimes. These include making public statements in the press, leaving letters on the graves of his victims and on the 20th anniversary of his death organizing a public memorial for his victims. Escobar's body was exhumed on 28 October 2006 at the request of some of his relatives in order to take a DNA sample to confirm the alleged paternity of an illegitimate child and remove all doubt about the identity of the body that had been buried next to his parents for 12 years. A video of the exhumation was broadcast by RCN, angering Marroquin, who accused his uncle, Roberto Escobar, and cousin, Nicolas Escobar, of being merchants of death by allowing the video to air. Chapter 5 Section 3, Hacienda Napoles After Escobar's death, the ranch, zoo and citadel at Hacienda Napoles were given by the government to low-income families under a law called Extinción de Dominio. The property has been converted into a theme park surrounded by four luxury hotels overlooking the zoo. Chapter 5 Section 4, Escobar Incorporated In 2014, 
Roberto Escobar founded Escobar Incorporated with Olaf K. Gustafsson and registered successor in interest rights for his brother Pablo Escobar in California, United States. Chapter 5 Section 5, Hippos Escobar kept four hippos in a private menagerie at Hacienda Napoles. They were deemed too difficult to seize and move after Escobar's death, and hence left on the untended estate. By 2007, the animals had multiplied to 16 and had taken to roaming the area for food in the nearby Magdalena River. In 2009, two adults and one calf escaped the herd and, after attacking humans and killing cattle, one of the adults was killed by hunters under authorization of the local authorities. As of early 2014, 40 hippos have been reported to exist in Puerto Triunfo, Antioquia, from the original four belonging to Escobar. Without management the population size is likely to more than double in the next decade. The National Geographic Channel produced a documentary about them titled Cocaine Hippos. A report published in a Yale student magazine noted that local environmentalists are campaigning to protect the animals, although there is no clear plan for what will happen to them. In 2018, National Geographic published another article on the hippos which found disagreement among environmentalists on whether they were having a positive or negative impact, but that conservationists and locals, particularly those in the tourism industry, were mostly in support of their continued presence. By October, 2021, the Colombian government had started a program to sterilize the hippos using a chemical to make them infertile. Chapter 5 Section 6, Apartment Demolition On the 22nd of February 2019, at 11.53 a.m. local time, Medellin authorities demolished the six-story Edificio Monaco apartment complex in the El Poblado neighborhood where, according to retired Colombian General Rosso José Serrano, Escobar planned some of his most brazen attacks. The building was initially built for Escobar's wife but was gutted by a Cali cartel car bomb in 1988, and had remained unoccupied ever since, becoming an attraction to foreign tourists seeking out Escobar's physical legacy. Mayor Federico Gutierrez had been pushing to raise the building and erect in its place a park honoring the thousands of cartel victims, including four presidential candidates and some 500 police officers. Colombian President Ivan Duque said the demolition means that history is not going to be written in terms of the perpetrators but by recognizing the victims, hoping the demolition would showcase that the city had evolved significantly and had more to offer than the legacy left by the cartels. Chapter 6, In Popular Culture Chapter 6, Section 1, Books Escobar has been the subject of several books, including the following. Escobar, by Roberto Escobar, written by his brother shows how he became infamous and ultimately died. Escobar Gaviria, Roberto. My brother, Pablo Escobar. Escobar Incorporated ISBN 978-0692706374. Kings of Cocaine, by Guy Gugliotta, retells the history and operations of the Medellin cartel, and Escobar's role within it. Killing Pablo, The Hunt for the World's Greatest Outlaw, by Mark Bowden, relates how Escobar was killed and his cartel dismantled by U.S. Special Forces and Intelligence, the Colombian military, and Los Pepes. Pablo Escobar, My Father, by Juan Pablo Escobar, translated by Andrea Rosenberg. Pablo Escobar, Beyond Narcos, by Sean Atwood, tells the story of Pablo and the Medellin cartel in the context of the failed war on drugs, ISBN 978-1537296302. American Maid, Who Killed Barry Seal. Pablo Escobar or George H. W. Bush, by Sean Atwood, tells Pablo's story as a suspect in the murder of CIA pilot Barry Seal, ISBN 978-1537637198. Loving Pablo, Hating Escobar by Virginia Vallejo, originally published by Penguin Random House in Spanish in 2007, and later translated to 16 languages. News of a Kidnapping, 
non-fiction 1996 book by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and published in English in 1997. Chapter 6, Section 2, Films Two major feature films on Escobar, Escobar and Killing Pablo, were announced in 2007. Details about them, and additional films about Escobar, are listed below. Blow, a 2001 American biographical film based on George Jung, a member of the Medellin cartel, Escobar was portrayed by Cliff Curtis. Pablo Escobar, the King of Coke is a TV movie documentary by National Geographic, featuring archival footage and commentary by stakeholders. Escobar was delayed because of producer Oliver Stone's involvement with the George W. Bush biopic W. As of 2008, the release date of Escobar remained unconfirmed. Regarding the film, Stone said, This is a great project about a fascinating man who took on the system. I think I have to thank Scarface, and maybe even Ari Gold. Killing Pablo, was supposedly in development for several years, directed by Joe Carnahan. It was to be based on Mark Bowden's 2001 book of the same title, which in turn was based on his 31-part Philadelphia Inquirer series of articles on the subject. The cast was reported to include Christian Bale as Major Steve Jacobi and Venezuelan actor Edgar Ramirez as Escobar. In December 2008, Bob Yari, producer of Killing Pablo, filed for bankruptcy. Escobar, Paradise Lost, a romantic thriller in which a naive Canadian surfer falls in love with a girl who turns out to be Escobar's niece. Loving Pablo, a 2017 Spanish film based on Virginia Vallejo's book Loving Pablo, hating Escobar with Javier Bardem as Escobar, and Penelope Cruz as Virginia Vallejo. American Made, a 2017 American biographical film based on Barry Seal, Escobar was portrayed by Mauricio Meggia. Chapter 6 Section 3, Television In 2005, Court TV crime documentary series Mugshots released an episode on Escobar titled Pablo Escobar, Hunting the Drug Lord. In the 2007 HBO television series Entourage, actor Vincent Chase is cast as Escobar in a fictional film entitled Medellin. One of ESPN's 30 for 30 series films, The Two Escobars, by directors Jeff and Michael Zimbalist, looks back at Colombia's World Cup run in 1994 and the relationship between sports and the country's criminal gangs, notably the Medellin narcotics cartel run by Escobar. The other Escobar in the film title refers to former Colombian defender Andres Escobar, who was shot and killed one month after conceding an own goal that contributed to the elimination of the Colombian national team from the 1994 FIFA World Cup. Caracol TV produced a television series, El Cartel, which began airing on June 4, 2008 where Escobar is portrayed by an unknown model when he is shot down by Cartel del Sur's hitmen. Also Caracol TV produced a TV series, Pablo Escobar, El Patron del Mal, which began airing on 28 May 2012, and stars Andres Parra as Pablo Escobar. It is based on Alonso Salazar's book La Parabola de Pablo. Para reprises his role in TV series Football Dreams, A World of Passion and El Señor de los Cielos. Para has declared not to play the character again so as not to pigeonhole himself. RTI Producciones produced a TV series for RCN Television, Tres Canes, was released on 4 March 2013, which Escobar is portrayed by the Colombian actor Juan Pablo Franco in the first phase of the series. Franco reprises his role in Surviving Escobar, alias J.J. The same year 2013, Fox Telecolombia produced for RCN Television a TV series, alias El Mexicano, released on 5 November 2013, which Escobar is portrayed by an unknown actor in a minor role. A Netflix original television series depicting the story of Escobar, titled Narcos, was released on 28 August, 2015, starring Brazilian actor Wagner Moura as Pablo. Season 2 premiered on the streaming service on 2 September 2016. In 2016 RCN Television produced the TV series En La Boca del Lobo, 
was released on 16 August 2016, which Escobar is portrayed by Fabio Restrepo as the character of Flavio Escalar. National Geographic in 2016 broadcast a biography series Facing the that included an episode featuring Escobar. On 24 January 2018 Netflix released the 68-minute long documentary Countdown to Death, Pablo Escobar directed by Santiago Diaz and Pablo Martin Farina. Killing Escobar was a documentary televised in the UK in 2021. It concerned a failed attempt by mercenaries, contracted by the Cali cartel and led by Peter McAleese to assassinate Escobar in 1989. Fox Telecolombia produced in 2019 a TV series, El General Naranjo, which aired on 24 May 2019, which Escobar is portrayed by the Colombian actor Federico Rivera. Chapter 6, Section 4, Music The 2013 song Pablo by American rapper E-40 serves as an ode to the legacy of Pablo Escobar. The 2016 album The Life of Pablo by American rapper Kanye West was named after the three Pablos that inspired and represented some part of the album with one of them being Pablo Escobar.